Okay. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Amisha Walia, who comes to us from Northwestern University. Uh, Dr. Walia is uh, got her undergraduate degree from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., um, where she also received her medical degree, uh, then continued on as a resident and fellow at Northwestern, um, where she also received her MS in clinical investigation and joined the faculty there uh, as assistant professor in the department of in the division of endocrine and metabolism in the department of medicine. Um, she has received uh, numerous awards for her teaching and scholarship, um, both from the university and uh, national and, and regional awards. Um, she has been very involved in um, guideline uh, guidelines for glucose monitoring uh, and uh, involved in the American Diabetes Association uh, work. Um, and she uh, has also been um, active in national meetings, both in the, the uh, American Association of Clinical Endocrinology, American Diabetes Association, as chair, moderator, et cetera, um, with a focus in diabetes and um, has uh, been involved in uh, a number of uh, clinical trials, um, both from you know, she has one from AHRQ, Implementation and Testing of a Diabetes Discharge Intervention um, to Improve Safety During Transitions of Care, uh, a Diabetes Prevention Programs Outcome Research Project, uh, a part of a U01, uh, the Epidemiology of Diabetes Interventions and Complications as a PI, um, and has extensive publications in this area as well. Um, and we are absolutely delighted to have her here, albeit virtually, um, to uh, talk to us about the intersection of COVID-19 and diabetes, uh, wicked problems and collaborative solutions. So take it from there, thank you. Thank you so much. So welcome everyone. Um, I just, this is, um, gonna, I'm gonna be talking about the intersection of COVID-19 and, and diabetes. Um, <clears throat> So, wicked problems and collaborative solutions. So, I wanted to start out with my disclosures. So, I will not be discussing off-label use of diabetes medications. I will, I do have research support um, as listed here, but I do want to make a point that I will be talking about diabetes technology and currently I do not have any um, disclosures pertinent to continuous glucose monitoring, which I will be spending some time talking about. So my objectives, I will be discussing the intersection of COVID-19 with the diabetes epidemic. Um, we will review current glycemic control standards and examine approaches, including use of diabetes technology to improve glycemic control in the pre and peri COVID-19 era. Um, we will illustrate novel research methods and findings in diabetes that will address challenges to care now and in the post COVID-19 era. So what is a wicked problem? So this terminology actually comes from social policy planning and anthropology, and we're actually living through two of the largest wicked problems of our lifetime. One is climate change and the other is, of course, COVID-19. And the, pro the way that they're defined is they're difficult to solve because they have incomplete, contradictory, or changing requirements. So you have multiple stakeholders with different perspectives and real world constraints, which prevent multiple and risk-free attempts at solving the problem. And we obviously know about climate change and COVID-19, these are not easy solutions. I was um, just coming out of my fellowship and I remember listening to a talk much like this from an anthropologist who was talking about a wicked, wicked problems in healthcare. And I talked to her afterward at length and I was describing to her what I studied in diabetes, some of which I will be reviewing with you all today. And she said, you definitely have a wicked problem on your hands. And so um, what I really want to talk about today is this intersection of these the pandemic with the epidemic of diabetes and um, 
how we had breakthroughs in technology that hopefully will carry us through for the next several years. When I first started as a resident way back when, um, that was the era of intensive glycemic control. So there was a, in the inpatient setting, there was the Leuven ICU study, the Vandenberg study that showed improved glycemic outcomes with a, a glucose level between 80 and 110 and um, readily many uh, guidelines adopted aggressive gly glycemic control. Um, however, in during um, my years during residency um, and, and into fellowship, several other studies came out that that did not show some of the same significant findings that was found in that original SICU study. And in fact, um, with nice sugar in 2009, um, actually showed that perhaps um, more intensive glycemic control could lead to poor outcomes if in fact there was more hypoglycemia. And interestingly enough, the same thing was happening in the out patient setting as well. There were many studies that were that came along right as I was coming out of my training and um, sh you know, leading to this question of, of, of what should our glycemic targets be? And I always show this slide to highlight that when, when this debate was going on, it really can, and, and still sometimes goes on today, it can be confusing, I remember, to the hospitalists or primary care, but really we're arguing about a narrow window right in here. Um, and really, I think there's very, very good evidence that patients shouldn't be um, generally, if at all possible, above 180 or 200. Um, but it was a very interesting time to to come out and train and and think about you know this pendulum of change. And current recommendations re, um, do kind of try to capture this. So in the inpatient setting, um, in the critical care units, the general recommendation is 140 to 180. However, with an asterisk that if you are at a center that has very low hypoglycemia or you're able to implement 110 and 140, especially in certain populations like cardiothoracic surgery, for instance, you can have more aggressive um, uh, targets, um, at which we at, in some units here at Northwestern do have, and in the outpatient setting, this is really reflective of having this modified A1C for those with with diabetes. Um, and yet, although I will not show this data here, we're not you were not reaching anywhere near these targets in terms of a A1C in the outpatient setting. Um, and in addition. Insulins and oral hypoglycemics are two of our most dangerous agents and um, always next to anticoagulants, um, antiplatelet therapy, as you can see here, insulin is always number one or number two on the list of adverse drug events and oral hypoglycemics uh, as well. And so these are actually um, very high risk medications um, that are generally about 85% of patients with diabetes are treated by non-endocrinology providers um, and and I think that you know it, we we have to do a better job of of really um, training everyone on the medications, but also um, on the use of, of of technological advances. Some of which I'll highlight in this talk. Um, and yet. Um, hyperglycemia or death from hyperglycemia should really be a never event. This is data looking at ER visits um, and ER uh, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemic visits, and really death from a hyperglycemic crisis in this day and age should really be a never event, yet we still have over 2,000 deaths every year in this regard. And as I said before, we're not really meeting targets, but the barriers to diabetes care are, are 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 so evident and anyone in any field can can recognize it because um i think diabetes touches all almost all patients in some form or the other um whether it's themselves or others this is a review that my mentor at the time mark mulich and i wrote um on insulin ther insulin therapy for type 2 diabetes 
and back in 2014, but this has not really changed. I reviewed at length, um, this was a systematic review, and we reviewed at length uh, medication barriers, especially specifically to insulin. And this really shaped my, this exercise really shaped my thinking um, during that time and even today in regards to barriers to diabetes care. And none of these are new. So, you know, clinical inertia, financial, patient, you know, patient-centered fears. So costs, adverse side effects, specifically hypoglycemia, um, and then there are physician provider and educator barriers at, at, at every level. And this idea of psychological, in this case, it was called insulin resistant, which is just resistance um, in general to, to starting these new meds. But what I was also shaped really about was the level of evidence in regards to being able to address these barriers. So when we reviewed this, um, Mark and I actually printed out every abstract, um, you know, from the 90s and the stack for RCTs in regards to new insulins was this high. The stack for barriers um, or anything addressing care was this high. And the level of evidence, which we had to grade very readily um, for this review was, was generally um, I wouldn't say poor, but was suboptimal for the magnitude of the problem. And so it was very clear, I think, at that time for me that, you know, a lot of money was being funneled to the new medication after new medication, but, but really so little was being done to sort of address getting our patients the care that they that they that they needed and that has been no more apparent um when you know we talk about covid-19 so um this this was true before the pandemic and then of course a year ago our lives changed and, and normally i would be um really enjoying madison right now with with you i would have probably driven up and and um met some of you in person and 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 i, I have can definitely say you know life has changed dramatically and i don't think we'll ever ever you know, sort of process things in the same way before, you know, before and after. And this is where I think I, I want to talk about the intersection of this pandemic with the epidemic. And as we all know, in so many facets of life, COVID-19 has unmasked or unearthed, unearthed these um, very um, underlying issues. And I think that has nowhere um, been more clear as well in diabetes. So, First, this is data on COVID-19 mortality risk in those with diabetes. It was a very large study out of the UK in patients with type 1, type 2 diabetes, and no diabetes. And this is data um, looking at mortality strat stratified by both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And as, I, as you can see, increased mortality in both type 1 and type 2, two diabetes. And then um, this is data from the United States from several hospitals in the in the country where they they very early on looked at over a thousand COVID confirmed patients, and over you know fifty two percent just had uncontrolled hyperglycemia, forty eight percent actually had previously diagnosed diabetes, um, forty percent of those patient days had uncontrolled hyperglycemia defined as greater than one eighty, and the mortality mortality rate in those patients was much greater regardless of diabetes and or hyperglycemia. And then um, this is data from from China. I always like showing this picture because I think the way that we look at information and especially research has definitely changed over the year. I think some of us finally joined Twitter as I did last year. Um, and, and people always ask me like, what's a good graphic abstract? So I always like to include this this picture that has this very interesting graphic abstract that definitely conveys their message. So this was a study in cell metabolism that looked at over 7,000 COVID-19 patients with or without diabetes. Um, diabetes status increased the risk for medical intervention, it increased mortality risk, and well 
uncontrolled blood glucose levels correlated with improved outcomes in infected patients. Um, so, so definitely, as we would suspect, um, COVID-19 has hit our patients with diabetes and or hyperglycemia um, very hard. And, and one of my actually last meetings I had in early March was with the head of our Institute of Public Health, who also is in the diabetes space. And I remember saying to him, you know, I'm really worried this could, you know, decimate our work um, because this could be just horrible for our patient population. And I don't, well, I don't think that premonition is at its worst form. I think in terms of um, what will unveil and what, what will be revealed in the next year or two um, in terms of not just diabetes or COVID related deaths, but access, including access death with diabetes patients. Um, I think it's going to be, um, very excessive. I know I have patients in research studies and, and we've had reported for years, we've been following some of these patients, had many reported um, deaths and um, uh, subsequent events um, that that really, um, I don't think that that we really understand the full toll of, of what we were going through. Um, in terms of uh, diabetes medications, this very early on, I know Dr. Krines and I um, exchanged uh, emails and, and lively discussions with other endocrinologists about the intersection of various diabetes medications and COVID-19. Um, I will not go piecemeal by each one, um, but I, I want to say that um, there has, if, if anyone is looking for a, a really beautiful review on the topic, um, Dr. Drucker has this wonderful review um, in endocrine reviews on the topic. And But what I will highlight is um, just really some, some data fresh um, off the press um, looking at different glucose lowering therapies and risk of COVID-19 mortality. And um, this is a, again, nationwide observational study in England looking at people with COVID-19 and type 2 diabetes. And interestingly here, um, we, we, you have the breakdown of all the different types of diabetes medications. And <clears throat> insulin, which has been seen in, in cohort studies and other smaller retrospective studies, um, those on insulin really having a higher mortality. Um, and then um, interestingly, and this is corroborates with other data, um, metformin um, and SGLT2s having perhaps some benefit. Um, what was really interesting in this in this paper, which has been a, a large debate, is what would be the effect of DPP-4 inhibitors? Um, and here um, looks like, um, you know, a little bit of an increased risk, which has been wild, widely debated. What's interesting is that, you know, we see in these larger studies that insulin appears to, um, you know, have some sort of um, effect, but a lot of people have written that off as residual confounding and retrospective um, data sets uh, because none of this data has been prospective per se yet. And however, with DPP-4 inhibitors, we can't really say that, like write it off in that way, because generally that's not the case. They're generally used alongside metformin or instead of metformin, often very early on in the disease course. Um, so I wanted to take one minute to talk about DPP-4 inhibitors, um, because I think that they're, they're, the, the story on that is, is very interesting. Um, DPP-4, which um, is a diabetes medication, um, in a, a, a inhibitor is a diabetes diabetes um, medication. And actually, interestingly, um, it was um, membrane-associated human DPP-4 is a functional coronavirus receptor. Um, it serves as a co-receptor for a subset of coronaviruses and actually was considered a potential therapeutic for MERS um, CoV. And um, the effect of DPP-4 in a inhibition is really, you know, thought to be unknown. Um, doing a deep dive, I do a lot of clinical trials, translation to clinical practice, so I had already reviewed this topic, um, and why this came up was that a lot of hospitals were actually early on in the days um, when we, when, when 
perhaps we were really trying to reduce nursing time and PPE use um, of all of the other diabe diabetes agents, DPP-4 inhibitors were have been studied in RCTs to show that they, in, in, sub, in a small subset of patients, can replace insulin in the inpatient setting. So people were, were, were um, using some protocols utilizing DPP-4 inhibition for uh, glucose control. Um, and I was always a little bit wary of doing that, um, largely because they have a known side effect profile of nasopharyngitis, upper, upper respiratory tract infection. Um, the, the WHO database actually has reported URIs associated with um, DPP-4 inhibitor use. It's, it's been known to be involved in immune regulation, but in clinical practice and large CVOTs trials really hasn't been, that effect hasn't been seen. Um, and there is this theoretical risk in some, uh, some specific DPP-4 inhibitors of um, ACE inhibitor induced peritracheal edema um, with DPP-4 inhibition, but really outside of maybe one or two studies has not been shown to be a major issue. So sort of looking at the big picture, um, because COVID-19 is affecting in terms of morbidity and mortality or diabetes patients, I think that there is a robust literature that will be coming out. This is from just two weeks ago, Endocrine Society had several abstracts looking at various medications like I, I talked um, briefly about. Um, the theoretical and with metformin, um, the meta-analysis that was presented at Endocrine Society, recent meta-analysis showed a, a, a positive association with reduced mortality. RCTs are still pending. Um, and, and I reviewed DPP-4 inhibition. The uh, meta-analysis that was presented at Endocrine Society a few weeks ago showed no association with reduced mortality. Um, insulin, as I said, has been associated with harm in multiple studies in patients with COVID-19 but many feel that this is just residual confounding. Um, and then there are many um, RCTs pending um, looking at potential use of SGLT2 inhibitors for actually in the treatment paradigm of, of COVID-19. And sulfonuria, as the question is out, that study showed maybe a, a, um, a no harm to, to some benefit, and, and so really um, not, not, not clear. And so what are the optimal glucose levels for, for patients with COVID-19? Um, here is data from um, that I that I looked, my group looked at several years ago in liver transplant. And why I always show this is that this is the relationship between um, post-liver transplant glucose perioperative glucose, um, meaning inpatient glucose mean, and the risk of rejection within one year post-transplant. And as you can see here, this um, lowest risk around this 110, 140 area, um, and, and those on high dose, and these patients are, were all on high dose ster steroids. So, um, and then, um, what is likely a, a linear relationship. And so I think that, you know, in terms of, I don't think we're going to see, you know, op, you know RCT data um, anytime soon um, with glycemic control and COVID-19 in the inpatient setting. But generally, I do think that the, we should stick with the current guidelines, which is if you're able to safely, without very much hypoglycemia, aim for 110 to 140, we should be doing that, but allowing 140 to 180 if, if needed. Um, and, and as you can see here, that, that is the area that I've highlighted. Um, and we did a pragmatic clinical trial in the same liver transplant population. And we actually, you know, I get this question a lot, like, what is really the difference between 140 and 180? And it, and I always said, well, you know, I mean, it couldn't be much, right? It's just 40 milligrams per deciliter. But this data actually really changed the way I think about this. Um, this is data from our pragmatic trial, looking at two different insulin protocols in that same liver transplant uh, cohort group. Uh, and as you can see here a, a significant reduction in infection in the 140 group. Um, the difference in mean here was actually 150 to 175. So it was actually even narrower um, when you actually looked at a, um, mean glucose between the two groups. And this was really largely driven in the first 40, 50, 60 days. Um, so I think the question then becomes, 
you know, how um, this intersection of COVID-19 and diabetes, how can we strive for control both in the inpatient and outpatient setting when we were having trouble doing this even before COVID-19? And I think the question um, becomes, what are the solutions? And so this is where wicked problems do have solutions. So they are, some can be authoritative in nature. So um, system-wide mandatory changes, any Anyone that works in a large health system is very familiar with these, so these are easy to adopt. Um, but they have, you know, the solution targets, especially to let's say the doctor in their outpatient clinic um, far away, may not, you know, may be very unclear and can have unintended consequences. There is the competitive. So um, I put these examples: Emmy, Health Loop, Mitonomy, and. These are di diabetes. They have diabetes as part of their portfolio, but this is just one example there that you might not recognize these names, but you might may recognize their videos. So large health systems have been purchasing this software to generally um, first starting in heart failure education, then going to diabetes, then going to post-operative, very similar business models for all of them actually, where large health healthcare systems will 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 purchase their large suite of education um, online and, and, and um, videos. Um, they not, you know, when I looked at the ones for diabetes, they're not a great fit, right? They're not individualized, they're for the masses and, and you know, the best one will win. Um, collaborative, the way, you know, what I work in is, um, takes years. So some of the stuff that I'm going to review work from my lab, I mean, has taken us five, six, seven, eight years to actually from writing a grant to getting it, being able to to actually put it into practice, which um, you know, in a in this COVID nineteen era is you know, I mean, just really way way too long, um, and resources are scarce, and um, you know, we can't always have all the stakeholders um, as well. Um, and so I do did want to highlight two authoritative solutions um, that I think will really shape diabetes and actually all of our care moving forward. Um, and so I kind of wanted to highlight this for especially um, a medicine audience um, that um, spans so much different types of care, inpatient to outpatient. Um, two things that the government did, um, thankfully, um, one was. Um, obviously being able to utilize telemedicine and telehealth, which I'll briefly review. And then the other is continuous glucose monitoring um, and the home use of blood glucose meters in the hospital at enforcement discretion. So essentially looking the other, other way. And I um, highlight these two because in looking at um, paradigm shifts in diabetes management, um, I think these two really highlight the, these solutions that actually can be paired together. So the private and the public sector working together on these sort of wicked problems and coming up with solutions. Um, just to highlight, this is the summary of Medicare telemedicine services that can be found online. I always show this slide because I always think, you know, we don't use these virtual check-in or e-visits um, enough, although they have um, associated HCPCS or, or um, CPT codes um, for established patients, such as those with diabetes. So 10 minute check-ins um, to see if people actually need to come in or communication through an online portal. Um, I think this will be the future um, for, for, for telemedicine and even telehealth. Um, so what is the real face of telemedicine? Every time I show this slide, people laugh. Um, so I, uh, early on in the pandemic, I had a residence clinic and uh, that it converted actually to telemedicine. It, it was a woman health bone clinic and diabetes clinic. And between having older patients with osteoporosis and, and patients with high risk with diabetes, no one wanted to come in. So I had already converted that to a telemedicine clinic. And it happened to be that I had women's health residents rotating through. So, and, and, um, I'm very good friends with the, with the, um, the, 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 uh, uh, program director and he said you know they're actually interestingly the residents are not getting enough telemedicine so we would love if we can keep this up so we created a, a um a you know this this virtual clinic once a week for the residents 
And I, I, what I heard over and over again is it's just really ineffective. It, it's, a, it's hard. I'm trying to figure it out. And so um, maybe my second or third month, uh, I actually had the um, resident send me a picture. And so you can see her picture on the bottom, uh, bottom right. And that, that's me chuckling. Um, that's me on the left. So I sent her a picture of my setup. And so I have four screens. My... Um, uh, I full full disclosure, my husband is a former trader, so these are actually his old setup. So we had, you know, multiple uh, cameras and very, very high speed internet for screen. So I have my, um, if you can see in one corner, my bone density, the glucose CGM and the right. Um, the EMR and then actually the the resident on, on another program and the patient on another program. Um, and so I think I show this picture because I think we need to, especially with endocrinology, um, endocrinologists um, have been number one to adopt for many reasons. And it's effective, but actually we're see, we're able to see more patients and effectively um, do care actually uh, and sometimes optimally and and actually bring in uh, in some most cases more revenue depending on the type of um, health system and structure in place and so but we need to understand that there are needs for the telehealth world and um, that includes screens and a quiet place to work and good internet and tech support um, and so why is endocrinology sort of number one or number two to adopt um, and that's what I want to walk you through a little bit right now. So um, the efficacy of telemedicine in diabetes has been well studied. And so we have been number one adopt because we know it's effective. So this is a, actually just a recent meta analysis, but this is there were 43 studies assessed um, looking at um, HbA1c, there were, uh, as you can see, really favors reductions in, in um, HbA1c, really favors telehealth. This is across the board, um, although this wasn't seen necessarily with systolic blood pressure, um, data in diastolic, um, diastolic blood pressure control, uh, postprandial glucose, fasting glucose and weight all favor telemedicine and not even shown here, but quality of life. Interestingly, um, asynchronous, I, people always ask this question, what about asynchronous versus synchronous teleconsultation? This is another meta-analysis that looked at um, all types of telemedicine visits, um, video conferencing combined asynchronous and synchronous, as well as other forms. So while the pooled reduction in A1C was not significant, asynchronous care delivery actually had improved self-care and clinical values, but synchronous telecommunication had high usability of technology and cost reduction. So I think that, um, and the combined actually had an improved quality of life overall. So I think that that's what tells us is, is this works, but we need to figure out how it will long-term be in our sustainability model. Um, people always ask me about apps. I'm actually in the website development space now, which I'll highlight. And interestingly enough, um, I always say the same thing as I let the patient decide because there's just too many. And this is data from a technical brief report from AHRQ looking at um, self-management apps for diabetes and they this was in 2018 there were hundreds of apps only 11 were associated or actually studied health outcomes five of the 11 were associated with an actual clinical improvement in a1c none of them showed improvements of quality of life blood pressure weight or bmi they were all consistently short in duration inconsistent methods co-interventions um, were numerous and were actually of of pretty Poor quality. So where does that leave us? So we have a lot out there. Um, I, you know, it was in, in this space, and we're inundated with with different forms of of you know patient engagement solutions, education materials, 
uh, you know, um, take home kits and and mobile apps. This is just a, highlighting another very similar report um, that just generally shows that these apps come and go at the hundreds. Um, so what's really going to move the needle? And I think we all know that one of the things that moves the needle is technology. And so um, continuous glucose monitoring was really just um, get taking foot in the clinical practice setting because, you know, over the last several years, the sensors have gotten better and better. And I think that the COVID-19 era has really ushered in whether um, hospitalists or internal medicine um, uh, providers are ready um, ushering in continuous glucose monitoring. Um, so I wanted to highlight here continuous glucose monitoring in the inpatient space as opposed to outpatient because this is where since COVID-19 has occurred, money, much of um, the data is coming out from. And also it, it's also shows that uh, I think my personal story is you just never know where your life or research will will take you. Um, and so I was really in 2016 and 2017, I was involved with um, a consensus statement round table. We met actually twice um, in 2016 and in 2017 related to diabetes technology society meeting. And, and I was actually leading the, this effort at the time. And, and I remember very distinctly uh, having having dinner with my colleagues after our meeting and and talking about, wow, this space may be dead. And the reason why I said that or why we thought that was so there was there was a ton at that time of very specific sensors for inpatient um, that were being tested. And um, they were invasive, so some were intervascular, arterial, minimally invasive, subcutaneous, or transdermal. Um, when we reviewed the literature, there was 15 CGM devices reported, um, you know, testing frequency very frequently. S the systematic reviews at the time um, were very few, but largely RCTs, um, observational studies, um, and, the, in the, and mainly in critically ill patients, didn't improve glycemic control, sort of non-inferior. The trials were small. There were different sensors, different units, um, and they were mainly performance and accuracy based. And when we talked to the companies, they were actually sunsetting almost all of these sensors for the inpatient setting. So actually at that time, um, and they said, you know, outpatient space is where we're focusing. We're focusing on type two diabetes and outpatient, and, and we're sunsetting a lot of these this technology. And then of course, and, and actually so much so, I at that time decided, um, I was thinking about getting into the space and actually I decided to go into the transitional space setting, um, which I'll talk a, a little bit about in, in a little bit later, but, um, so much so, I I just didn't see a future for this. However, that all changed because the sensors from on the outpatient setting got better and better, and then COVID nineteen hit. And what um, Shivani Agarwal in New York, um, which was very very hard hit, she um, is uh, very well known in disparities and type one diabetes, and actually she created a workflow for inpatient of using. Um, um, outpatient CGM in the inpatient setting, and you can see here very good correlation um, values um, with in with the the continuous glucose monitor. You can see this picture um, on the on the on the right, looking at um, you know uh, the you know a skilled endocrine NP would would put it on the arms, um, the placement of the receiver, as you can see, was facing out, and um, alerts were given to nursing staff, as you can see here. This is data just showing very good correlation. This is with the Dexcom G6 CGM. Um, and there have been tons of pilot studies. These slides are courtesy of several of the groups that have been doing this work. Um, this is remote CGM with computerized guided um, uh, <clears throat> infusion, insulin infusion protocols for critically ill patients in COVID-19 medical ICU proof of concept. 
Um, <clears throat> and then similar with a, with the, the uh, with one of the other continuous glucose monitors, the this is Fr Freestyle Libre Pro Flash CGMS, um, looking um, very similar to point of care testing and actually showing um, more hypoglycemia. And at the same time, although these studies came out um, in the last year, the data was largely collected pre-COVID-19, but both studies, one out of San Diego, the other out of the VA um, in Baltimore, showing um, both um, you know, some improvement in the use of CGM and on the warts, um, mean glucose, and then also decreasing hypoglycemia in the study at, at the VA. So what are the um, limitations? What do I see as the next step? So I think the sec sensor technology is pretty much there. Um, drift, calibration, measurement lag, things we worried about with some of the different pass sensors are not really there. There is some device-specific interference, but I think that could be um, overcome by epic alerts, um, things of various nature. I think for acutely, very, very critically ill, if they're actively hypotensive, hypothermic, hypoxic, that is a, an issue. Um, implementation is going to be a huge issue and cost. Um, you know, planning data integration, I think, is going to be one of the I'm on service right now, actually, and, and never before um, we have while we have not been using CGM in the hospital, we have been allowing our patients to maintain their CGM um, that they come in from home. And I have, you know, I, I'm joking. I'm like, I, apparently I'm running a home CGM rounds where we have, you know, their home CGM up on one computer and the inpatient point of care and the other and, and it's actually very helpful. Um, <clears throat> likely these companies are going to be going for, for FDA approval will be my guess because they've seen um, uh, several groups really embrace it on, on the COVID wards. Um, and then um, I think it'll come down to cost and um, also examining whether we can be making insulin decision making um, around around this technology. Um, like we we can for um, some sensors in the outpatient space. There are always pros and cons um, to anything. So, you know, we really have to make sure that our trade off is worth it. So if there's a hypoglycemic event and the alert is triggered, but missed, you know, was the benefit truly gained? And, um, you know, we really need to have the right training and support and we need to ask for it for with this technology. I think this is really important. Um, and so. I shared with you some very collaborative solutions, um, you know, for example, CGM and research. So these, this partnering of the companies with, with various research institutions over the last year to do so much proof of concept in this area. Um, but, you know, is this going to be enough to usher us just, uh, out of the 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 COVID nineteen era, and I think unfortunately the answer is no. Um, we we're going to need even more than that. And so, what is more than than these collaborative solutions? So, <clears throat> interestingly. Prior to even COVID hitting, I was working in the space of transitions of care, as I, as I said, looking at use of CGM and various technologies at discharge. And at that time, I was working very closely with an engineer, looking at various risks from our, um, from our McCormick School of Engineering. And um, they said, we really should be talking to the Design Institute. And I said, the Design Institute, what does that have to do with medicine? Um, and actually, this is this intersection of, you know, of, of the right brain with the left brain with art, technology, and science. And actually, very interestingly, at the same time, I was doing some light reading with the Jobs biography. Um, so anyone has a few minutes, you want to read it. It is, it is um, not a short read. Um, but it was, it was, it was all happened at the same time. And and I remember reading that Jobs biography and, and thinking, um, wow, yeah, I mean, I do remember the days of this phone. And then now, you know, I mean, I, I, my iPhone broke uh, during COVID-19 and I thought my life would end um, because we do so much. And it was really this breakdown between the engineering departments and the design departments and integration of different types of thinking and user-centered design that um, really broke through this technology that really changes the way that we process information and make decisions um, as 
we are experiencing in both our political and healthcare climate currently. And so um, how do we do with user-centered design and healthcare? Very poorly. Um, so probably the number one thing we use is software. Um, few EHRs, if any, do anything with user design processes, which I'm sure any of us who sit in front of an EHR today, EHR today know. Um, the, the basics of user-centered design is really around identifying user needs. Um, and so I, we've been working with the School of Engineering and the Siegel Design Institute to look at these design phases for different healthcare problems. And so I have really focused on survival skills teaching at discharge. Um, and so just this is just to give you a flavor of, of how one does this. You look at in-depth review um, of the causes of barriers, you review existing tools and processes, and then you generate solution specifications. So as you can see here, um, this is what is out there. Um, you know, this this one in the in the right corner is what our um APP service has in their pockets, essentially. Um, and so a hodgepodge of various ways that they teach. Um, we pre-COVID, we had done um, over 100 potential user sessions trying to understand how patients who were discharged um, obtained survival skills, um, glucose meter teaching and insulin teaching. Um, we interviewed anyone that touches the process, including even actually lay people who may do not have diabetes. And um, in 70 learning collaborative sessions, user design sessions, um, tried to evaluate um, what could be designed. This is an example of one of our first design sessions pre-pandemic, you see people in the background, they interact with various tools that are available. Um, we've worked with um, several countless students up north in our Evanston campus, looking at various ways to combat the problem. Here is our third generation prototype, and then the current prototype that we were supposed to be testing actually in April of last year, um, which is a um, software interface um, with an in-person kit as well. And 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 then COVID hit, and and actually, this ha is currently adjunctive to diabetes education in the hospital. But we realized that with COVID nineteen, I was getting so many questions of how do we deliver survival skills in this setting? This seems impossible. Um, and we we said, you know what, we we need to branch out, and that we found our collaborator in human computer interaction and design, and um, our collaborator collaborator who is also a learning scientist, there's an entire science around how we learn online or through our phones and, and um, the way that software is developed for health education generally does not contain a lot of these principles. Um, and so when we hooked up with our learning scientists, the first thing he said is you have to go back to your user needs and, and remap them to some key principles. And so this was data that was just presented uh, as an oral at Endocrine Society from one of our wonderful fellows, Grace Prince. And I won't go walk you through all of this data um, because generally I think it's all things we know if you've ever discharge someone from the hospital or on the other end seeing a hospital follow-up i mean we all know there's challenges in in understanding of self-care sorry um there's challenges in preparing items for self-care and there's challenges in administrating self-care at home so i'll take I, I won't walk you through all of the data but i really want to highlight um, you know, some of the challenges in understanding self care. So, you know, being overwhelmed, we all know this quote, it's kind of hard because you're really not focused. It's just not the right time. Right. Um, and, um, an overview is a good thing, but really I want a small snippet. And so this m many, many of our, um, results map to spiral learning. And so, um, our learning scientist collaborator, you know, was trying to explain to us how we can actually redevelop our software and redevelop the experience 
experience of learning through the spiral learning concept. And so I was like, I need a very hard example. And so it was funny, he's much younger than I am. So he said, you know, do you know, have you watched Cobra Kai? And I said, you mean Karate Kid? And um, the example he gave is martial arts. So the idea that a white belt needs to learn how to block, but the way that that initial skill blocking will be utilized through each of the belts is very different, right? Um, so what you learn as a blocking technique as a red belt is very different if you are a brown belt. And so uh, taking this concept to health education, for example, um, with diabetes, we would say, you know, the concept concept of learning about insulin for food versus then carb counting, right, is very different. So the idea is that we can create software or education platforms that allow us to allow people to come in at the spiral that they're at and move forward at the speed in which they're at may actually be technologically more advanced and what then we're what we're able to do in person in the in in different care settings. Um, so what are the pitfalls we need to look out for? This is something that I think about greatly. Um, the two thing, one of the first things that um, I worry about is, uh, everyone worries about, right, is technology pushback. Um, and I call this the Instapot effect. So if anyone know, if you don't know what an Instapot is, so Instapot actually revolutionized cooking for those who were using um, slow cookers. So, and it actually the technology comes from a very, very specialized sensor that they're able to put in the machine that then allows to you to cook in a very safe way and a much more rapid way. So example, beans that would overnight in a slow cooker may take 12, 14 hours can potentially take 20 minutes. Um, and so every Christmas, my, I tell my husband, I want to get an Instapot for my mother-in-law and the price, you know, over the last five, six years has dropped precipitously. And, and as you see in this slide, now it's $79. $79. Why can't I buy it? Every year he says the same thing, which is like, it will be unused. And, and finally, um, you know, two Christmases ago, he sat me down and, and was like, you have to stop asking. And I said, I just don't understand when this revolutionize um her entire you know her entire cooking you know world like it has for me and he said you know it it really like the she has so many recipes that she's gathered over so many years she would have to relearn every single one it's very doubtful that she would do that that benefit to her is is not perceived and will never be used so i think we have to really understand this and not dismiss it and really think about what is the time we're going to need and the support we're going to need? And is that benefit truly gained? And I think we're going to find this out in all of these various technological components that we've just ta talked about and reviewed. Um, the next pitfall I want to really talk about um, is what keeps me up at night, which is the unintended consequences of the diabetes technology divide. I see this in my patients and it really worries me and actually it's supported now by more and more data. So what we're seeing is that basically our patients with continuous glucose monitors at home um, during lockdown did better. They um, had lower glucoses, lower A1Cs, less hypoglycemia. Um, this is early data from Italy that 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 showed that and then this is early data from Turkey um, that showed people with type 2 diabetes without technology doing worse, gaining a lot of weight, having um, much worse uh, glucoses and A1Cs and weight gain. Um, and so I think we really need to think about this. Um, and then this was um, a another panel I was a part of where they discussed what are the barriers to telehealth in, let's say, a Medicaid population. And so there's such a strong reliance to physical exam. And again, kind of trying to fit in everything for that person, right? Vaccination procedures, um, a difficulty onboarding HCPs in patients. Um, uh, navigating health technology through legacy workflow, so exactly some of the things that I've highlighted today. Um, difficulty when translating, um, you know, during the telehealth, when translation is needed during the telehealth exchange and difficulty reaching patients in their homes with phone or internet. Um, a lot of this to doing with social determinants of health, which I have not even begun to touch on because that could be a talk all on its own. So um, really to wrap up, how 
how can we build a bridge? It's really acknowledging, I think, that this is a problem. Um, I'm always amazed that sometimes I'll talk to tech companies or various others, and, and they're like, you know, we just have to acknowledge that this exists. Um, I think point of care testing and use of point of care testing can it will really help us. User centered design. I hope I. I um, highlighted that and then advocacy and research and then we just have to say that this is a priority and and really think about how we can we can do this um and then um these are my acknowledgements so many people around the work that i showed you from my own lab and then many many thanks and um really stay safe and be well great great Thank you so much um, for the overview. Uh, and um, it's funny because I remember when that 2001 paper in hypoglycemic control came out for the SICU as a critical care fellow. And, you know, we did journal club on it. We changed our practice. Everybody bought into it. And then the follow ups like, eh, maybe not so much. So, um, uh, I, and I'm going to start off with a question in terms of the balance between uh, endocrinologists following patients with diabetes versus primary care. What, what, how do you um, manage that transition? Which do you, when do you hand back off? Given the volume of patients with diabetes and numbers, I mean, it's just not practical for all patients to be followed by an endocrinologist or maybe not even desirable. So, thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, um, it's really tough because endocrinology is always put in this really tough position. We want to see the patient, but, you know, we don't want to see them forever. Um, I think the two ways, um, like in, in the two areas of work that I work in, I, I have a cardiometabolic talk. I think that where endocrinologists are in the future going to be utilized is this influx of technology use and then also um, really integrating some of the new diabetes medications and cardio metabolic health. Um, so, especially now with the use of SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists, um, we have different, we've tried different things. So, we've had a, you know, like a, a tune-up clinic where if it's over eight that, you know, you can, you can refer to the endocrinologist. We tune them up and um, send them back. I think that anyone's guidance it definitely has to change because now we have diabetes medications that have cardiovascular indications and so i think endocrinologists um, need to be at the forefront of helping build out technology and or help the clinical decision support platform and then really helping you know guide the initial kind of choices for both, if that makes sense, and then sending them back um, once those choices have stabilized and patients are doing well. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, in terms of the uptake by uh, of patients uh, for telemedicine um, for endocrine, what has been your experience? So the, actually, so my experience, I see a diabetes and osteoporosis. So like I have offered inpatient clinic and by and far my inpatient clinic has been at least mostly telemedicine by choice. It's starting to change a little bit. Um, what I see now is people want to see me once a year, um, but they want to see their cardiologist. They want to see their liver doctor. It's just the endocrinologist. They're like, oh, I don't know if I want to deal with parking. Um, but I think that what we're, what we're we've heard across the board um, from most of the endocrine divisions is that when COVID hit and, and we were allowed a little flexibility um, for those who are in RVU based systems, we're seeing more patients um, hitting better targets. And actually funny in the other systems too, having you know better A1C goals in some cases with the patients that they could reach and then having trouble reaching those. I think that was the biggest problem, this diabetes divide that I described. So generally, actually, people kind of don't want to go back. Um, they want to have this flexibility to be able to see patients more quickly, faster in a in a telehealth environment. Um, so it's going to be really interesting. Okay, there's a question with the new indication for SGL2 in heart failure. All of the heart failure cardiologists have been prescribing it more. How does this impact having multiple people, multiple specialties responsible for managing it? 
Yeah, so it's funny because I was part of a working group um, with Endocrine Society representing Endocrine Society for quality measures. And this was, I mean, we we don't know, right? Like some, you know, how this will affect, I think there's going to be unintended consequences, um, unintended consequences in regards to um, patients, you know, that they're on diabetes medications, others, and maybe they haven't been quite titrated. We have at our institution uh, come up with a combined sort of cardiology protocol of when to refer for di you know, to the diabetologist, um, like an A1C greater than nine and very, you know, or various other on insulin, um, or, you know, things of that nature to kind of help guide that. But I think we're going to be finding out. I definitely think as nephrologists and cardiologists should um we we, we should you know they, they should be prescribing i think it's um de depending on how many other medications they're on and some safety issues i think that's when the endocrinologist can be involved okay great well we are um at the top of the hour so i want to thank dr walia again for um a, a really comprehensive overview of diabetes and the intersection with covid um, and uh, look forward to having you physically visit sometime soon. Um, driving up for some cheese curds, love to host you. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.